Hi, I thought I'd do a couple of practical solved examples that make use of dimensional analysis. These two examples involve the calculation of form drag on an object, which is a rather practical problem for mechanical engineers. So the first example, what we're looking at is calculating the drag force on a sphere in a flow of water. And then in the second example, we're going to do the same type of calculation, but this time uh, for the drag force on a sports car traveling at high speed in air. So this is example one. In this example, what we're considering is water at 20 degrees C flowing at a velocity of 0 0.55 meters per second over a fixed sphere with outside diameter of 15 centimeters. What we want to calculate here is first a part, the drag coefficient, which will denote C subscript D, and then the drag force on the sphere, in other words, the force required to hold the sphere in position. So here's the solution. Uh, just to remind you, the drag coefficient is a dimensionless parameter that we've talked about in some of the previous videos on dimensional analysis. The drag coefficient CD is the ratio of the drag force FD, so FD is the, is the drag force on the object, divided by one half rho times the free stream velocity squared times an area. And if you remember from Bernoulli's equation, one half rho u squared, if you do a Bernoulli analysis, you can show that that's actually the stagnation pressure. That's the pressure at the sort of the front stagnation point of the cylinder as the flow decelerates and goes from the free stream velocity to zero at the stagnation point. So that pressure times the, the frontal area of the uh, sphere uh, represents the pressure force on the front of the sphere pushing the sphere downstream. Of course, that pressure doesn't exist over the entire sphere, but it's a measure of the, of the drag force. Uh, so it's, and it has the units of force, so it can be used to non-dimensionalize the drag force FD. Now, A, the area here, A proj, is the projected area. It's the projected front, frontal area taken uh, normal to the direction of flow, and I'll talk about that more later in this video. Now, this force, this drag force FD, is called form drag or pressure drag. It's caused by the pressure distribution over the sphere. I should point out that this, that in reality, you get a little extra drag than what we're going to calculate here. This drag force FD calculated in this manner does not include the fluid shear stress at the surface. There's an extra bit of drag on the cylinder because of so-called skin friction. Remember from chapter one that uh, tau at the wall that's mu du dy or mu du dn. But this skin friction is usually quite small on so-called bluff bodies. When you're dealing with highly streamlined bodies, you might need to add in skin friction, but normally it can be neglected on, on something like a sphere. So we're just going to calculate the so-called form drag or pressure drag. Now, if you recall, I think it might be one of the first videos I did in this, in chapter five, I talked about the dimensional analysis for this drag coefficient, and we showed that this drag coefficient, the dimensionless parameter of the drag force over one half rho uh, u squared a is just a function of the Reynolds number once you fix the geometry. For a sphere, the drag coefficient is only a function of the Reynolds number. And here's the figure taken from your textbook. And so here we have the variation of the drag coefficient CD versus Reynolds number. And as we showed previously, for a, a fixed geometry, and what we're looking at here, of course, is the curve for the sphere, you get a single curve. So what we need to do next in order to calculate the drag coefficient is calculate the Reynolds number and then basically look it up on this curve. So we start by calculating the Reynolds number 
based on the outer diameter of the of the sphere. And the Reynolds number, remember, is rho times the free stream velocity times the diameter of the sphere divided by the dynamic viscosity of the fluid. Oh, I should also point out that this drag coefficient versus Reynolds number is based on experiments. So this curve here is not an analysis curve. It's actually making measurements, different size spheres and cylinders in uh, different fluids. So what we're going to do now is calculate the Reynolds number. This is water at 20 degrees C, and so you can look up in the back of your book in the appendices that the density of water at 20 degrees C is 998 kilograms per cubic meter, and its dynamic viscosity is about 1 times 10 to the minus 3 kilogram per meter second. And so it's a straightforward thing to calculate the Reynolds number. We have uh, the density of water, 998 kilograms per cubic meter, the free stream velocity, 0.55 meter per second. This is a 15 centimeter uh, sphere, so the small d diameter is 0.15 meters, and then we have on the bottom here the dynamic viscosity of uh, water at 20 degrees C. And we get a Reynolds number of 8.2 times 10 to the 4. So now we go back to our uh, figure from the textbook that shows the experimental data of the drag coefficient versus the Reynolds number, and I'm just going to do this visually. You could take a ruler if you want. We're dealing somewhere around Remember, this is a log scale here, so 8 times 10 to the 4 is going to be somewhere in around here. And we can come across, and I estimated just visually that based on these experimental results, that the drag coefficient for a, a sphere at a Reynolds number of 8.2 times 10 to the 4 is about 0.45. So that's the answer to part A. So now moving on to part B. In part B, what we want to calculate is the drag force on this sphere. In other words, what we're trying to do is calculate the force in this pillar here required to restrain the sphere in place. So we have that the drag coefficient is 0.45. And so in order to calculate the drag force here, what we're going to do is rearrange this expression. So the drag force is CD, which we know, one half rho of the water, the free stream velocity squared times this projected area. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. The projected area, in this case, is the frontal projected area for the sphere, and that's a circle. And so, in this case, the projected area is just pi d squared upon 4, the diameter of the sphere is 15 centimeters. And when we multiply this out, we get the surface area of 1.77 times 10 to the minus 2 square meters. So this is just simply the area of a circle. And what this is, this is the area normal to the oncoming flow. It's the area that the flow sees as an obstruction. So the projected frontal area, this A proj, is a circle. It's not the surface area of a sphere, which is a common error the students sometimes make. We'll come back to this issue when we talk about the car as well in the next example. So here I've written the drag force that we're after in terms of the drag coefficient that we know and this term here is the stagnation pressure at the front stagnation point times the projected area of the sphere. So now I think we have everything we need to calculate this. The drag coefficient we got from knowing the Reynolds number is 0.45, so 1 half. The density of water here. The free stream velocity is 0.55 meters per second, squared of course. And then this is your frontal projected area. Let's just check the units here. This is going to become, of course, meters squared over seconds squared. And so what we're going to end up with is kilogram. Uh, so we're going to have meters to the fourth here and meters to the cubed on the bottom. So it's going to be kilogram meters per second squared. 
right? So we're going to get that the drag force is, when we multiply this out, 1.2 kilogram meter per second squared, and a kilogram meter per second squared from F equals ma is a newton. So the answer is 1.2 newtons. Of course, this is a, a relatively small force, but it is a relatively low velocity and a small uh, sphere. Just like to end this example by making a couple of comments. This force that we've calculated is the drag force caused by the pressure distribution over the sphere. So what happens is you get a high pressure region, I call it P high, at the front end of the cylinder, and flow separates here, and we get a, a low pressure region behind, and that causes a net force on the sphere in the downstream direction. And that's, so it's just the, the drag force caused by the pressure distribution, which would be um, the vast majority of the drag force on a sphere. Now, if you wanted to reduce the drag on this sphere, you could make it more streamlined. Here I've made it more of an oblate sphere. I've sort of squashed it down and made it more so the flow can flow over this more smoothly. And if you do that, there are two effects that reduce the drag. One is, of course, I've made, in this case, I've made the, the frontal area, the projected frontal area, smaller. So that'll definitely reduce the drag force. But even if that area was the same, even if the frontal area that this thing, this squashed sphere had, even if it was the same, by making it more of an oblong shape, you'd end up with a more favorable pressure distribution. What would happen is flow would separate uh, later, so the flow would separate farther down the uh, surface, and you get a smaller you get a smaller turbulent wake, and that would result in a reduction in drag by making it more streamlined. Basically, you'd have a region on the back side here, the low pressure region would become smaller, and that would uh, result in less uh, drag. Okay, this is example two. Example two deals with calculating the drag force on a Porsche 911 sports car. And I looked up on the Porsche site that a Porsche 911 Turbo has a drag coefficient of 0.31. And we're going to assume that's the drag coefficient at its top speed. The drag coefficient on an automobile would change slightly with its speed, in other words, with its Reynolds number. but uh, a uh, car is considered what's called a bluff body. The separation points don't change very much with speed, and so the drag coefficient would be relatively independent of Reynolds number. So we can take CD as 0.31 as being a relatively constant value for drag coefficient, which we're going to assume applies at its top speed. Now, I also looked up on the uh, website, the Porsche website, what the frontal area of the car is, and the effective projected frontal area is about 2.2 square meters. And so what we're talking about here is the, the frontal area here of the car, including the windscreen, of course, and including the, uh, the mirrors. And this would be the area projected into a a vertical plane here. So uh, if you were just looking at this front on, how much area it, it occupies. So given that information, we want to calculate the drag force on the car in air, of course, at 20 degrees C in one atmosphere at its top track speed, which is about 315 kilometers an hour. And then using that drag force, estimate how much horsepower is required to overcome the form drag at this speed. And we can assume that's going to be a significant fraction of the total engine horsepower. So here's the solution. It starts with the expression that we had from the, the previous example, where the form drag is the drag coefficient times 1 half rho u squared. So rho is the density of air, u is the velocity of the vehicle squared, and a proj is the projected frontal area that we talked about, 2.2 square meters. So 
we need rho, of course, here. Rho is the density of air at 20 degrees C. Since it's an atmospheric pressure, we can look it up in the tables in the appendix of the book, 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, we also need to convert the U here. We've got the speed in kilometers per hour, so I converted that to meters per second. So we have 315 kilometers an hour. There's 1,000 meters per kilometer. So that's going to give you in meters per hour. But we need in meters per second, and there's 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. So 60 times 60, there's 3,600 seconds uh, per hour. And so that's, so we multiply by one over 3,600 and that gives you uh, the result you want in meters per second. And so we get that a Porsche traveling at top speed travels at 87 and a half meters per second. So now it's a relatively simple matter to calculate the drag force, this form drag force here. It's CD, which equals 0.31, 1 half rho of air is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, the velocity of the vehicle is 87.5 meters per second, of course squared, and times the projected frontal area, which is 2.2 square meters. And when you multiply that out, that works out to about 3,133, uh, of course, kilograms meter per second squared, which is a newton. You can check the units here, right? We're going to have kilograms, and that's going to become meters squared. So we have meters to the fourth on the top here, meters cubed on the bottom, so kilogram meter, and then this is going to become second squared, which is a newton. So we can check the unit's balance. And so the total force is about 3.13 kilonewtons. It's quite a substantial force because this automobile is traveling at high velocity. And it's worth noting that the drag force is proportional to velocity squared. So uh, at this high speed, the force is large. And what it means is that uh, uh, driving at twice the speed uh, you know, will reduce your gas mileage, roughly speaking, by about a factor of four. I mean, not all the drag is because of form drag, but it, at that high speed, it would be a very large fraction of the, of the total drag on the vehicle. So that's the answer to part A. Now the answer to part B is how much power is required to overcome this form drag. And I've reproduced here that we've calculated that the form drag is 3.13 kilonewtons. So the way we do this is, uh, of course, work is force times distance. And we want power, which is work per unit time. So we have to uh, divide by time here. So force times distance over time. And distance over time is the speed of the vehicle gives you the power. So we just multiply the drag force by the speed of the vehicle to give how much power is required to overcome the form drag. I'm sure you've seen this before in your other courses, perhaps your dynamics course. So we take the force, 3.13 kilonewtons, which of course becomes 3.13 times 10 to the 3 newtons, don't forget that, times the speed of the vehicle, 87.5 meters per second. And we have newton meter here. Let's check our units, right? A newton meter is a, is a joule. And so we have joules per second, which is watts. So we get 2.74 times 10 to the 5 watts of power. Now, what I've done is I've looked up the conversion that one horsepower is equal to 745.7 watts. So we can uh, use that conversion to find out that the total power, vehicle power, engine power required to overcome the form drag, drag is 368 horsepower, which is a good fraction of the uh, total engine power. And that's the answer to example two. I thought I'd end just by talking about something that I find quite interesting, which is the effect of surface roughness. Now this effect is a little bit counterintuitive. What this figure shows here is two bowling balls, so white bowling balls, smooth white bowling balls. If you read the caption here, they're 
eight, they're, they're small, well, eight and a half inch bowling balls dropped into water. This was done by the US Navy, surprisingly, perhaps. And what we have is two bowling balls being dropped into water at a speed of 25 feet per second. Now, the left ball here, this, this, this ball, the left one, is just a smooth bowling ball. And the right one over here is the same smooth bowling ball, but the front of this bowling ball, what they've done is they've glued on some sand to create some roughness. And the effect of this roughness is that the boundary layer of flow, we haven't talked much about boundary layers in this course, but the flow over this surface of the bowling ball in this case, because of the roughness here, is becomes turbulent. And the turbulent flow, uh, you've got more kinetic energy in the boundary layer and it delays the point of separation. Notice where the flow separates here versus where the flow separates on the, on the left hand uh, bowling ball. And so the result is turbulence in the boundary layer around the ball, and you're going to learn more about this, about boundary layers in the next course in fluid mechanics. Uh, but turbulence in the boundary layer delays separation, and it results in a much smaller wake. Look at the size of these bubbles here on over here. This is much smaller over here than over here. And the result is the roughness on the front edge of the bowling ball, on the nose of the bowling ball, results in more than 50% uh, lower drag coefficient on the right-hand bowling ball than on the left-hand bowling ball, which is somewhat counterintuitive. Now this is also the reason why uh, there are dimples on a golf ball. And I've shown a little picture here that, that if you had a smooth sphere, you'd get separation on a, a, a wake, a turbulent wake region that'd be much larger and a much, so the region of, of low pressure would, on the back side of the ball would be much larger and by having uh, dimples on the ball uh, the separation the flow separation gets delayed and moved downstream so you have a much smaller wake. Now I realize I've gone over this very quickly it's not a full explanation this could be a video on its own if you're interested feel free to ask me sometime in counseling I'd be happy to talk about the details of this it's a very interesting phenomenon and that completes this video